so well, I want to talk about nitrous oxide. Um, <clears throat> nitrous oxide. We we used to see this a bunch more. You still see this around. Uh, you see this in the dentist office. You know, we're familiar with it. Laughing gas, all that kind of stuff. You see it powering um, cars. And it, yes, it is the uh, the exact same thing. Um, <clears throat> nitrous oxide. Uh, has a lot of applications in EMS and it's potentially it's it's listed in like the WHO's um, like list of critical medicines i.e the safest most effective medicines that folks around the world can use um, even though it is uh, again the thing that you may put in the booster for your car um, exact exact same thing but you know medical grade <clears throat> um, comes in a blue tank uh, generally speaking labeled n 2 uh, and it is a really a good medicine, but we've kind of got away from using it because it's kind of easy to divert and there's the chance that like stuff could kind of happen. Um, and so it's, it, you know, we, we've kind of moved away from it. Um, when you start sucking off your own supply, uh, then all of a sudden nobody wants to do it anymore because everybody's nervous about it. <clears throat> but nitrous is one of those things that's like a really, it is a really good EMS medicine. It's fast on, it's fast off, it's relatively easy to use. It's a little bit expensive. It's not that expensive uh, anymore. Um, <clears throat> it's a little bit expensive uh, to get started with. But overall, this is something that like you give the patient, the patient does it themselves, they feel better. Uh, they have a really hard time overdosing on it for reasons that we'll talk about. And then when you're done with it, or if the patient gets a little too much, it goes away in like a minute. Um, this is like fentanyl, but a lot better, or like ketamine without kind of the bad intubate side effects that come with ketamine sometimes. So um, if you haven't looked into nitrous recently, I would encourage you to do so. Uh, I just finished writing a um, protocol for Kentucky for our, for our state protocols uh, to update on nitrous, um, and it'll, it'll be within the scope of a lot of people in the state. And if I can figure out a way to weasel it down into like the place where almost everybody can do it, then I will do that. But look into nitrous here. Let's talk about nitrous a little bit. Nitrous oxide. It is a volatile gas, meaning if you know you plop it down on the table at room temperature, it goes whoosh, uh, and goes into the atmosphere. <clears throat> um, it, uh, it comes you know in a tank just like any other of the gases that we use. It has a little bit of a sweet smell. It's more or less colorless. Colorless. It's denser than air, so if you had a whole bunch of it out there, it would collect on the floor if there was no ventilation. But uh, but the general properties of it are that when it is inhaled, um, it produces euphoria and analgesia, uh, and it's a dissociative, <clears throat> just like as I mentioned before, ketamine. How does it actually work? Um, think of the properties like uh, like light ketamine uh, in that it is a dissociative primarily. It does have some pain control, also like ketamine, um, <clears throat> but it's not that the patient doesn't know that something's happening. They just don't care that much. Uh, and that's kind of the idea behind the laughing gas part. You know, if you've ever seen a kid get this, it's not that they are anesthetic or unconscious to the fact that you're, you know, sticking them with a needle or drilling their teeth or draining an abscess or something like that. They just don't care that much. It's kind of like laugh about it. Uh, it's just not a big deal. Um, did I say it? It's a lot like ketamine uh, in that way. <clears throat> There's some other stuff in there too. We, we actually don't know what through what receptor nitrous oxide really works, um, truly. Uh, there's, it's got probably some GABA activity like alcohol. It's got probably some opioid activity. So if the patient's a heavy drug user, then uh, it's not as effective a lot of times. <clears throat> but 100%, we don't, we don't really know how it works. Magic is probably the, guess, the best guess. What seems clear is that it has a lot of NDMA uh, antagonism, again, like our friend Ketamine. So if you want to think of it as like quick on, quick off ketamine that uh, is not going to make somebody think you need to be intubated, that's pretty much what nitrous oxide is. We've known about nitrous oxide for a long time, as uh, you've probably seen, uh, you know, if you were a kid in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and you went to the dentist, and you needed something done, there's a good chance you got some laughing gas to do it. Um, and that was one of the first applications, you know, it was synthesized in like the 1700s, late 1700s, um, wasn't used for about 50 years or so. And then a dentist picked it up and started to use it for um, doing molar extractions, which, you know, it, rather than just have the person tied down essentially or held down and grab their tooth and pull it out. Um, now the person didn't really care and they would be compliant and they would kind of laugh their way through it more or less. 
this was generally safe. Uh, you can still use it for anesthesia. They, they still will use this in operating rooms. Sometimes it doesn't produce enough anesthesia to have the person you know, under ideal operating conditions or something like that. But a lot of times um, other gases will be flown or, or will flow in with it. Um, <clears throat> but you still do see it uh, around um, for use. Originally, it looked something like this. You just had a bag of, you had a tank, and then you had a bag of the gas where it collected, and you had the patient breathe in, um, and you use like a two-to-one mixture or something like that with oxygen. And again, it's, it's dissociative. It's not so much that you don't have pain or that your body can't tell something's going on or that you're unconscious. It just makes you kind of not care about it quite as much, but it does have some analgesic properties to it. You'll see it for use in the hospital and in clinics and stuff now. Depending on where you at, where you're at, uh, you may see it more um, <clears throat> more commonly as things like these, you know, what do they call them? Aestheticians, the guys that do like Botox in your face or like collagen injections in your lips or stuff like that, starting to use this stuff. Um, and you don't hear about them like killing a whole lot of people with it. So it's probably pretty easy to use uh, if they can. <clears throat> you still see it in the dentist office. In terms of actual, you know, medical care, uh, the places where this is probably good is in trauma. It's great for procedures, especially for kids, uh, or if you don't have an IV established or something that you can do quick. Um, <clears throat> it is a reasonable pain relief uh, for STEMIs and heart attacks in a lot of the world. And a lot of places will still use this for laboring patients. Um, and it's fairly safe uh, to use both uh, during, um, during late pregnancy and during labor itself. You'll see a lot of folks write contraindications to uh, nitrous oxide, which I can't figure out exactly why, because you use it for laboring patients um, to produce their own kind of uh, controlled analgesia uh, with it. <clears throat> That's where you may kind of run into it more uh, often nowadays. In Canada, in the UK and in Europe and that kind of stuff, and I don't want to say that we're, gosh, why don't we do stuff like some other country, but this is available for use by even like not paramedics, not EMT level, but just kind of responders who are trained in it. It's pretty safe stuff if you have a, engineering controls on it to make it a safe setup. The way that we, you know, used to do this was you would have a tank, if you look at this setup here, you got a tank of oxygen, you got a tank of nitrous. Um, when I was training, we had a blender here where you could kind of control how much of each one was. So you would start them on 100% oxygen and then you kind of wheel up the nitrous and you go to like 30 and then you go like 50 and I think you could do a little, you could do like a bit more. Again, in the operating room, they'll use like a two to one mixture or something like that. So like 60% nitrous and 30% um, oxygen or something like that however that math would work out. <clears throat> um, but what makes it a little bit easier is that now there's a preset blender on most of these things, um, which is this guy here that only lets you do a 50-50 mix, uh, a concentration that way. The uh, Of note, there's a little pink tube on the end of this thing, just to give you a quick heads up on it. That's a, that's a scavenger. Um, what it does is suck up the extra nitrous so that it's not like running around the room or something like that. Um, <clears throat> that you won't see that on EMS systems, but we'll look at EMS systems in a minute with it. What do you do with this? The thing about nitrous is that it is PCA. It's patient-controlled analgesia. The patient will determine how much they need. They admit you, you make it available to them, essentially, but then they administer it for themselves. Um, and this is, this is a relatively safe way to do things. You give the patient a mask you turn on the mixer or the tank or whatever it is, however it is that you're delivering it through your system. Um, <clears throat> and then if it's got a, uh, uh, a patient controlled valve on it, on the end of the uh, mask or on the end of the face piece or whatever you've got, patient puts it up to their face. <sighs> Nitrous only flows out when they take a breath in, when they activate the thing. <clears throat> and then when they have too much, when the, they either said, okay, my pain is controlled enough, I don't need more pain medicine they either take the thing off their face or if they get a little too much and they get drowsy, their hand falls away from their face and they can't take breaths in through the mask. It takes you to be in fairly cooperative with it um, and with a fair amount of, fair amount of insight uh, to be able to do this. So if the patient is real confused and they can't figure out how to hold the mask on their face, uh, then they're not going to get the gas, uh, which makes it really nice because that way, again, if you get a little bit too much um, or a lot too much and you get kind of sleepy, then hand falls away, 
and the patient doesn't get any more. And within like a minute of breathing room air, usually they are back to back to it, uh, and they may reach again for the mask and put it back up to their face, and they, they you just let them do it. Um, <clears throat> it's critical in these things though that you don't try to intervene. Um, again, when I was training, we have a we had a system that was a continuous flow, and you put this like little thing over the patient's nose, and we control how much the patient gets. But that means we have to monitor them. We have to be kind of careful with it. It's still really hard to overdose, truly overdose somebody on it, like a lot. Um, <clears throat> but when you take that away and you use these systems that we have for pre-hospital and uh, for like clinic type care, um, that really doesn't happen uh, much anymore. And you just let the patient do it, which is why it's so handy for use in even like minimally trained providers. It's really good stuff. <clears throat> That was, this is an Entonox uh, system, which is just a little bit different, uh, but this is what you'll see in the US. There's basically, there's Nitronox, which is uh, the name that's out there, um, which go through, I think Porter uh, is the, the um, company if you wanna look up the system. <clears throat> They're not free, that's for sure. Uh, but in the grand scheme of things, I think it's a pretty good investment. If I had to choose between buying, gosh, uh, I don't want to say a Lucas device, but if I had to, if I had to choose between outfitting um, ten ambulances with a Nitronox system um, versus buying one Lucas device, I'm going to think real heavily about buying ten Nitronox systems. And I think that's the I think that's the cost of how it works out anymore. Um, <clears throat> what you see here is that there's you know there's a carrying case, a bag. There is the mixer here uh, that delivers a preset 50-50 concentration of oxygen and uh, nitrous oxide. The little blue canister is the nitrous. The green is the oxygen, as, as you're familiar with. And then you can't really see it real well, but there is a little patient-activated um, valve here. And it, the patient activates it by taking a breath, having a seal and taking a breath in. <clears throat> so they have to be able to get kind of a seal on their face, and they have to have the uh, mental wherewithal to know that I have to take a breath to get that pain medicine. But when they do that, um, then they get a 50-50 mixture of gas. Um, and eventually they'll get some pretty good analgesia with it for most people. You might ask like, well, what happens if that tank, um, if the tank of oxygen runs dry, the thing's oxygen driven. So you can't get nitrous uh, without getting the oxygen. And if the nitrous runs dry, uh, then the patient just gets 100% oxygen. So mm -hmm. It's not quite, you know, paramedic proof. I'm sure that somebody will figure out a way to get through it. I shouldn't say paramedic proof. Well, oh, by the way, I'm paramedic. Uh, <clears throat> I can say that. Uh, but um, it's not quite like 100% foolproof. You could probably figure out a way to, to mess it up if you really tried hard, but it's awfully safe uh, in that way. Here's a picture of somebody using it. Again, what's the patient have? They got to hold the mask up to their face and they, he's got a hold of the valve on the end of his uh, hand there. And only when he takes a breath in is nitrous like filling that, uh, <clears throat> filling that mask. And again, when he gets enough, either when his pain is controlled or when he falls asleep, his hand kind of drifts away and he stops getting uh, the nitrous. And that's the little valve uh, up there. Good things about it, it produces analgesia and dissociation, uh, and it does so pretty quickly within a minute or so of breathing this stuff. Most people will have pretty solid effects uh, if, it, if it's gonna work. Some people, it doesn't really work very well um, <clears throat> for, some, for some reason, which again, I don't think we entirely know. But if it's gonna work, it usually works uh, within a minute or two. It usually wears off within a minute or two as well. It keeps the patient breathing, and if the patient stops breathing, they stop getting the medicine, and then they start breathing again. So that's good. It is patient controlled, uh, so the patient can tell can say exactly like, "Yes, I feel better with it. I've had enough for the moment." And then when they need more, this without having to ask you for it, you just say, "Here, bud, breathe in this thing. You'll feel better." And then the antidote for it, uh, generally speaking, is just oxygen. The worst case scenario, if they uh, get too much, the way to sort of support them is just to give them oxygen, either, you know, usually just be a passive means and they'll breathe in and out and they'll go away, um, or you can bag them with it. <clears throat> but that's, that's pretty much about the worst that happens with it. There's some stuff you got to watch out for, and I'll talk about that in just a second. The bad things that can kind of occur with it, um, <clears throat> you could get a little bit over sedated. Again, it wears off really fast. And if as long as you're not like holding the mask on the patient's face, which you can never do, um, <clears throat> or that they get, you know, their face pinned against it because they're up against a wall or something. I don't know. I suppose it could happen. <clears throat> they could get over sedated. It causes nausea, sort of like ketamine does. Um, giving them some Zofran is not a bad idea. It doesn't necessarily have to be IV Zofran if all you're doing is this, and that's the benefit of this, is that you don't have to have an IV. You don't have to poke them with a needle. They just feel a little bit better with it. <clears throat> 
Um, it is denser than air. So if you're in a poorly ventilated space and the patient uh, breathes this stuff in and out for a long time, you know, like half hour, 45 minutes or something like that, um, <clears throat> there's, a, there's a chance it can pool on the floor. Probably not going to be that big a deal, but you probably should open the window of the ambulance if you're using it in the back of a closed compartment and have the ventilation fans on. Um, that'll kind of keep that from happening. And again, we're not talking about a ton, but if you did, um, it, it is possible that uh, that it could pool on the floor of the ambulance and somebody down next to the floor could potentially get too much. So again, just open the, win open the window, turn on the ventilation fans. Um, it, it'll be okay, um, generally speaking. There was always this question about washout when the patient, this was again when we were giving it to the patient, so you're not really going to see it that much, but theoretically, if the patient got a whole bunch and then you turned it off right away, um, as, the, as the gas goes back out of their blood and or, um, goes back into the air in their alveoli, theoretically, if they have a lot of it in there, um, <clears throat> that can displace the oxygen that would have been in there and you could asphyxiate um, or at least drop your sat because it's all full of nitrous instead of being full of, uh, instead of being full of oxygen. The way that you do it with like the patient controlled stuff, you're really not gonna see that, but just be aware that if you um, do stop uh, using it, like when you turn it off or when the patient turns it off, it's probably a good idea just to be on the safe side, cover all your bases, just have them on oxygen for, you know, a couple of minutes afterwards and that'll all take care of itself. <clears throat> um, but not, not that big a deal in the stuff that we're talking about in the way that we're talking about using it. And then there's diversion. You know, you can't trust people not to uh, suck or inject uh, or eat things that they find on the floor or in a cabinet. Um, or that seem to make other people happy. So diversion is an issue. The way that you the way that you kind of keep track of how much is there is that you weigh the bottle when you've got the um, system. You treat it like essentially any other narcotic. Uh, if you had like a multi dose vial, essentially. So um, these the little cylinders don't last for a whole lot of time. You could maybe get like two short uses out of one, but for the most part, if you've got, you know, a 30 minute transfer, which is what I'm kind of thinking when it would really be helpful um, for a lot of stuff, you're probably going to deplete a lot of that. What you do is you weigh the cylinder before you put it in the ambulance, and then you weigh the cylinder um, after the run or at the end of your shift if you haven't used it and prove that the weight is, is you know, the same. <clears throat> um, uh, and that's how, you, that's how you keep track of it. And of course, any discrepancy is uh, bad stuff and uh, shouldn't go messing with it uh, if you're not using it on a patient uh, themselves. But you treat, it, you treat it this way, you just weigh it instead of looking at like volumes, essentially. Um, <clears throat> all right. Let's talk real quick about uh, protocol wise. I've gone over most of this already, but just as an FYI, if you were to write a protocol, it might look something like this, where it describes nitrous at the top, um, describes the benefits of it, and says the treatment effects within 30 seconds and last three to five minutes after you stop. That's probably at the outer end, but uh, theoretically possible. It is again critical that as you're doing this, that you tell people do not hold the mask for the patient. The patient has to be able to hold the mask up uh, and they have to be able to hold it on their face. So the indication for use would be, let's say severe pain, which pretty much everybody that calls an ambulance for some kind of pain is gonna say, oh yes, it's a 10 out of 10. Everybody knows this. Um, <clears throat> but uh, anything greater than six, which uh, I will say 99.99% of people are gonna say is good. The contraindications to it. If they can't breathe or re they're in respiratory stress, not a good choice. Um, <clears throat> if they have altered mental status, probably not a good choice. Uh, it's gonna make them a little more altered, but probably they're not gonna be able to figure out how to use the thing to start off with. Now we get into things that kind of have to do with one of the properties of it, which is you don't want to give it to somebody who's got gas trapped in their body. So COPDers who have gas kind of trapped in their lungs when they're overinflated, you don't want to give it to them because they can't blow it off uh, like, an, like you would normally. Theoretically, you don't want to give it to somebody with a pneumothorax or maybe a chest injury um, <clears throat> because that gas can get trapped, uh, you know, the pneumothorax gas can get trapped and replaced with the nitrous stuff and you could get too much of it that way. 
Um, <clears throat> so stuff like that you don't want. Theoretically, there's a contraindication in pregnancy, although I can't really figure out why, uh, because again, you can use it in labor. So um, I think it's just probably a combination of like little babies really like, little, little, little babies uh, really like oxygen and they don't really like carbon dioxide. And so you try not to mess with stuff if you can help it. I'm gonna continue to dig and see if I can figure out why it might be contraindicated in every place except labor, which again, doesn't make sense to me. If they can't hold the mask on their face because their face is jacked up, then they can't use the system. Um, <clears throat> if they can hold the mask on their face, even if you know this part of their face is jacked up, but this part's okay, or you have a face piece and it's like that, then it's okay. Um, <clears throat> and if they can't hold the mask or follow directions uh, for use of the system, you can't use it with them. If you're writing a protocol, uh, you would say turn on, get vital signs, put the patient on pulse oximetry, and if possible, an entitled CO2 monitor, and uh, turn on the ventilation fan. <clears throat> and then get the thing ready. Tell the patient to hold the mask up to their face and take normal breaths through it. Don't tell them to take big, deep breaths. Just take no breathe normally through this, uh, and it'll start giving you medicine. When they get uh, sleepy or when analgesia is achieved, you let their hand fall away. You don't touch the thing. You just leave it be. Um, <clears throat> don't put it back on their face. Even if they say, I've got two, I'm, you know, I need more, you have to let them do it. Um, if they get nausea, give them antiemetics. If their SAT gets low, discontinue use and just put them on oxygen. And that's pretty much it. That's essentially the entirety of um, the nitrous oxide protocol. Who could use this? Uh, it is right here in our um, scope of practice document. And right now it's got AEMT uh, on up, which is a fair number of people. Uh, I, again, I personally think this is probably safe for EMTs to use because there's not really, there's really not anything that is complicated about it. EMTs can use um, bronchodilators that are inhaled. Uh, this is a simpler system than that, and the indications are simpler. Uh, the treatment is that you kind of manage their airway and give them oxygen if, if bad things happen. So um, <clears throat> I will uh, um, somehow make the push here that uh, I think EMTs can safely use this and it probably falls within the interpretation of the scope of practice uh, document. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll see if we can make that happen. <clears throat> um, because I think once you put this out here, now, of course, it, you know, it, was, it meant a bit more when AEMTs couldn't do IV um, analgesia. Now they can. So like, what do you need it for there? Where you really need it is in the hands of the EMTs who don't have the means to do uh, all these other means of analgesia, but still run up all the time. BLS squads run up on horribly injured people with terribly bad injuries. Um, and this can be a, this can be a big uh, game changer for them. Now you have a really good, really safe medicine to help. So think of it as ketamine uh, that EMTs can give that goes away pretty quickly. <clears throat> It's simple, it's safe, you don't need an IV, it's quick on, it's quick off, um, <clears throat> and it is essentially EMS, uh, patient-controlled analgesia, which we don't have otherwise. It's a really good drug, uh, and we should look at it uh, more. Again, it's got a little bit of a startup cost to it, but I think you'll find that if you get used to using it, it's pretty well worth it, and your patients will, uh, will thank you for it. Again, check us out at emsgrandrounds.org. That is... Uh,